Happy Monday, everyone. How's everyone doing? Live. I'm trying to get this adjusted. All right. So, all right. I think it's live now. All right. It just did something different. I still don't have this thing figured out. I keep meaning to ask people about how to do this live better. And unless it's Monday at eight o'clock, I am not thinking about live. So I just got in, literally just finished hauling all of my life up four flights of stairs. I was away. Okay, maybe not all my life, but oh. Five trips up and down stairs to bring my things in, plus moving my car. Let me tell you, Brooklyn is not for the faint of heart or the weak and weary. I'm just saying. So I am giving it a minute. I hope you guys are having a good day. Let's see. I still haven't figured out how to invite people. So it is July 19th. Our month is half over. I hope you guys are having a good summer. All right. I am going to begin. I think I have myself together. All right. So tonight I wanted to speak and share some thoughts with you about the question, is God a misogynist? So this might seem like an odd question to be asking, especially in this group, but it was a topic that came up in conversation with someone a couple weeks ago. And I started thinking about it and I was like, you know what? I feel like a lot of people have some misunderstandings and have been really hurt um, in life and traumatized by church culture, unfortunately. And so I thought actually it might be a good topic to discuss. Um, you know, this is not something that I am not going to sit here and pretend that I understand all about God. I absolutely do not understand God some days. A lot of days, right? He's a really fascinating mystery to me. But I did want to speak on this topic and, you know, shed a little light about uh, the question for anyone who may feel that he is a misogynist. So we're going to break it down. And the first thing that I want to do is talk about just what a misogynist is. And I actually went to Google. <laughs> Because in my brain, I have my own picture of, you know, a man who makes, you know, rude jokes and comments, um, maybe would make uh, jokes about me even, um, you know, like put down someone who's thinking that a woman is there to wipe his shoes and, you know, barefoot, pregnant in the kitchen type, you know, orders people around. But this is just my own picture, right? Um, of someone, it's not necessarily, you know, I think, you know, we all have our own definition, right? So it's not like there's one right or wrong definition, but, you know, it's good to, I think, sometimes look up to get something a little more objective. And when I looked up misogynist and I went to psychology today, I found this article. Uh, and in this article, the author listed out characteristics, and I started thinking about this is really just even something good to speak about and share these characteristics there according to Psychology Today on Google. But, um, you know, for, for women who are either single, dating, or even engaged, because it's definitely not someone or the type of person you'd accidentally want to end up with. And... I thought the interesting thing about it was the article that I read up on um, said that the men who are misogynists aren't actually easy to identify. And I am not here to bash men, so please, <laughs> you know, I am not. This is just 
um, pointing out characteristics of this type of man. So uh, here are some characteristics according to this article. So one thing that stood out to me was these type of men actually are charming. They kind of have a Jekyll and Hyde type personality. So they can be like really charming and irresistible one moment and then the next moment rude. And another thing was extremely competitive with women. And another sign would be maybe even suddenly leaving a relationship without ending it. So kind of like ghosting someone. Um, I never thought about ghosting as a, a sign. Now, obviously, it's not necessarily, right? There could be many other reasons for ghosting. But uh, I, I thought it was an interesting, you know, characteristic. It also talked about kind of which went with my own personal, you know, idea or definition of liking to control women sexually and um, putting down women verbally. So either like demanding or withholding sex. Um, and then during sex, he is not interested in focusing so much on pleasing the woman. It's, it's more about him and his pleasure, not about the woman. And interesting, also uh, like hip hypocrisy, hypocritical a bit. He this type of man tends to break promises to women yet will keep promises to men also similarly will break um appointments or be late for appointments with women but will be on time when he has appointments with men so there's that that hypocritical you know not treating everyone the same and also, I thought this was interesting. It said on dates in this article, it said on dates, he will treat women the opposite of how the woman prefers. So for example, you know, he will insist if the woman is like an independent type of woman, he'll insist on ordering for her. But it's not like he's really ordering. For, it's not, it wasn't, this doesn't mean if a man <laughs> orders dinner for you that he's a misogynist. It's not like the same as if, you know, you're out, you're looking over the menu, you're joking, you're talking about what you like and then um, what you're, you're planning on having. And then he just orders for you politely when the waiter or waitress comes. This is more kind of like of an insult. And, um, you know, you as a woman are like, oh, okay, I didn't really, I didn't really want the steak. I wanted flounder, but guess I'm getting steak. Um, so, and then also a cheater does not feel he owes women monogamy. So these are the characteristics of a misogynist. Uh, so now the question is, um, I well, actually before I, I go on to the question, so these are just things I would say, obviously, if you see something pop up, and, and you're dating someone, you know, don't automatically assume that this, this man is a misogynist, you know, you want to ask questions, you, you would obviously want to observe and um, obviously a red flag is a red flag, you would, you'd want to pursue it a little bit, right? You'd, you'd want to figure out what is happening. Did this man just order me steak? when I wanted flounder because he's just like nervous or is he like really trying to, you know, lay down the law and make me feel uncomfortable and prove his manhood in some, you know, strange way. So, you know, you would kind of, as time goes on, I don't think it would take much time, but you know, you'd want to pursue um, and, and ask questions and observe. So just because someone has um, one or two of these things does not, mean that you know you should just cut them off and and assume anything about the person <laughs> so i, I do want to say that so um now moving on to the question is god a misogynist so i would say looking at the definitions the first thing at least for me i would i would put it and i would match it up to my experiences my personal experiences so if we as individuals think about our experiences um, 
for those of us who have had a relationship with God. Now, if you have never had a relationship with God, it would be kind of hard to uh, have personal experiences to line up um, and make some comparisons uh, with the characteristics of what, you know, the Psychology Today article said one should look out for. Um, so I'm going to give some other tips for how to, you know, figure this out. But my personal experience, okay, um, just like any other relationship that I have with, you know, my best friend, with my parents, um, with my cousin, with my students, with coworkers, with whoever, um, you know, I'm going to compare my experience with God uh, to these, these characteristics. Has God ever broken promises to me? Well, sometimes it might feel like he does when he doesn't answer my prayers. But just because my prayer doesn't always get answered, does that mean it's a broken promise? Not really. It could be just me being a spoiled brat, right? Just because, for example, um, a two-year-old in the store wants, you know, 13 different types of candy and the parent says no, does that mean that the parent is a bad parent? All right. So, you know, uh, like I said, sometimes it might feel like God has broken a promise. And so I would, I, I, I get it. Um, but but really think about it. Has God ever broken promises to you? I know for me, I can say he has not broken any promises to me. And so I would say also things like Jekyll and Hyde. Do I feel like one day God is being nice to me and the next day God is putting me down? No. Um, has God cheated on me? I'm not sure what that would look like. Could I say I've cheated on God? Yeah, I've definitely had times in my life where I have put other people and things above him. Um, but I, I, I don't have the experience of the reverse. Um, this is me personally, just like putting this up um, against you know my per personal experience. Um, competitive? Do I feel like God competes with me? He's God. Why would He compete with me? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think I'm any competition. I, I don't. So I would. I would say He doesn't fit that category. Um, has God ever left me suddenly, like in the relationship? Sometimes it feels like where's God in a situation. Uh, so I, I can see how someone might feel like God just suddenly disappeared. Um, but at least for me, in the times where I feel like God has been missing or God went MIA, there are actually things that I might have done, like um, been unforgiving towards another person. And so he's just, you know, letting me uh, come to my senses about forgiveness of someone. Um, so uh, sometimes I'm not wanting to listen. Sometimes he is trying to tell me something, but it's not what I want to hear. And so I feel like he's not there, but it's just that he's not doing what I want. <laughs> and I'm actually being the spoiled two-year-old. Um, has God put me down verbally ever? No, that's that's not the voice of God. Um, that could be another voice, society, my own, my own self judgment. But no. Um, so these are when I line them up against my experiences. My personal experience is that he is not a misogynist. So, what if you have never? known God, right? Maybe you don't know a lot about God. So how how would you know whether or not he is a misogynist? So it would be really hard to have personal experience and be able to go through this this list of characteristics and and figure out does he do does it does it fit? Does the shoe fit? Um so in that case I would say that 
it's important to look at others' experiences. Um, what do other people say? And specifically even, um, I, would, I would say that for me, if I didn't have an experience, <clears throat> I would look, okay, I probably wouldn't know where to look. <laughs> so I'm going to say that there is a verse and it is John 14, 9. And Jesus is speaking to a disciple. I think it's Philip. I could be wrong. But he's speaking to a disciple. And he says to his disciple, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So basically he's saying that if you have seen me, um, how I am is the same way God is. So if I look then by logic at the life of Jesus and what Jesus did and how he treated women, then I would have an idea about how God feels about women. And I would have a, a clearer picture on whether or not he is or is not a misogynist. So um, here is, I'm gonna give four examples. All right, there's more, but I'm going to give four examples. There's this one story um, it's in several, I think it's in a couple different books. I didn't write down the verse, <laughs> the exact verse, but there is this woman and, uh, she's being harassed by these religious leaders and they're, they're giving her a hard time and they want to stone her to death because she committed adultery and the, the law was that she should be stoned to death. And so they ask Jesus, well, hey, here's this woman and, uh, you know, she did something bad. What do you think we should do with her? And he doesn't answer them until he finally says, um, well, it, whoever's perfect can cast the first stone. That's basically what he says. Um, he who's without sin can cast the first stone. And no one, none of the men is perfect. And so no one throws a stone and off these men go and she's by herself. And um, Jesus is like, so I guess no one's condemning you. No one's going to stone you. And she's like, no, they all left. And he's like, well, I don't condemn you either. You know, go ahead and, you know, live a new life. Go and sin no more. He basically you know, says, take this as having a new start. He does not condemn her. He doesn't um, put her down verbally. He's not rude. He's not polite to her in front of the men, the religious leaders, and then when they're in private, treat her a different way. Um, he's not late for this appointment with this woman. He's on time. She's in a bind. She's about ready to get stoned to death by these, these men. And here he is, right? Um, so he he's right on time. He's not late for his appointment to help her out. Um, he doesn't just leave her, okay? Um, so he doesn't just say, oh, this is an awkward situation and my response might be a little controversial. I'm just going to sneak on out here. He, he stays with her until they are gone and just, you know, gently sends her on her way and, and encourages her to, you know, turn over a new leaf. But he doesn't order her to do it. So it does imply that she has a bit of a choice that he'd prefer for her to do, you know, differently. But it seems very gentle to me, at least when I read it. So there's that example. Um, then there is a story of this woman uh, Jesus is walking through this crowd to go heal someone else. And there's this woman, this is a really famous story. I'm sure you have maybe heard it. Um, so there's this woman and, and she's been bleeding for like 12 years or 10 years. She's been bleeding for a long time. I think it's 12 years and no one can help her. And so socially, if a woman at that time was bleeding, you can't be around anyone. And also as a woman, you can't just be like walking up to men in this society. So here she is 
bleeding. She's in a social situation. She's around people. So she's breaking a social custom or a law and a religious law at that. And she is also, she goes up and she just touches Jesus. Like she tries to do it without being seen. And she feels that if she can just touch him, that, you know, he's been doing so many miracles, there just must be something super powerful about him and she'll be okay. Um, it's kind of like her last resort, maybe. And he's like, oh, okay, someone touched me. Who was it? And when he finds out it's a woman, right, he doesn't yell at her, okay? Um, there is, he's not, he's not competitive um, with, with her. He's not, um, he's not putting her down or anything verbally and saying how wrong it was for her to be around other people when she's bleeding or how, you know, don't you know you're not just supposed to be going up to men and touching them? This is just not socially appropriate. He doesn't, he doesn't do anything like that. Um, he just says, well, your faith is amazing and I'm going to honor your faith and just go live your life in peace. And, you know, so he blesses her. Again, this story um, does not line up with, in my opinion, the characteristics of a misogynist. And so, you know, I am leaving this for you guys to all decide for yourself. I'm just bringing some points up. Um, third example that I wanted to share is this woman who uh, he had become friends with after he had, you know, helped her out. She had had, I believe there's another story about how she had been um, demon possessed and she'd had, you know, a bad life. She'd been a prostitute. It had been really hard and he helped her out and he. And um, so anyway, uh, they become really good friends and she at this dinner party again breaks all the social and religious rules because here's the men at this dinner table and she's there with them and she breaks this bottle of perfume and she anoints his feet and she washes it with her hair and you could say oh well this is like a perfect example of um you know a misogynist because this woman is wiping her feet or a man's feet with her hair on the other hand, if someone saved your life and transformed your world that was like a hot mess and awful, like literally hell, I, I would wash their feet too. I would, you know, definitely want to serve them and, and do some really special things to honor them and to show how much I appreciate them. So as a woman, I get what she did. And also, the other thing is, is that when another a man, Judas, um, can, you know, he's, he's complaining about it and he's saying, oh, this woman, you know, she could have done other things. This is just inappropriate and unacceptable, you know, for her to be in this situation. She's wasting money. And Jesus is like, leave her alone. So he stands up for her. Um, he doesn't, this is how I see it, of course, this is my interpretation, but my interpretation is he stands up for her. Um, in the characteristics that I went over earlier of a misogynist, you know, these misogynists are competitive with women, they're controlling of women. Um, they are not standing up for women. So I personally, you know, this is why I, you know, my opinion is that this is another example of how, if you look at how he's, how Jesus is treating this woman, Mary, it doesn't line up with that of a misogynist. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention, it's not a specific example, it's just general. If you look at the stories um, of the, the time that, um, in, the, in the Bible, of the time that Jesus was, uh, helping other other people. He helped men and women. It does not seem anywhere, at least where I have been able to read, 
um, any place where he prefers to help a woman or he prefers to help a man. It seems that if someone needs help, he helps them. Um, so this is, this is, um, this is that, that example. You could, you could use these, these examples if, if you've never, um, you know, personally known God to maybe help you figure out if you do feel that God is a misogynist or you have felt hurt because there have been like leaders or religious leaders who have kind of made it seem like if you are a woman, you are less than a man. Um, you know, well, if Jesus represents God and do these things line up, is this really accurate? Or were those leaders or those people that you experienced um, who were putting women down, were they actually representing someone other than God? That would be my question. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly is um, how, according to Genesis, men and women came to be. And there is the part where Adam, he put, where God puts Adam to sleep and takes from Adam a rib and makes a woman. So, um, you know, I, I understand the, the argument that, well, if, if God found women to be important, then he would have just created her on her own instead of taking her from a man. Um, I, I get it. I, I, I can see how it could be interpreted that way. But I also would like to just kind of point out a couple things. Um, the part of the body is the rib. Um, it's not that um, something was taken from Adam's skull, indicating like maybe a woman being superior, or taking a bone from Adam's foot, maybe indicating that a woman would be inferior. Um, it was taken from a rib. And a rib is on this is again my interpretation, but like the rib is on our side, right? So what happens when you're on a side, if you're side by side next to someone, right? That indicates things like friendship, partnership, collaboration. Um, equality. Now, obviously men and women are different, but there is that side by side, it's not something that's higher or lower. Um, so to me, when I look at the position of um, a body part, I see that as like an indication of, it really is a sign that God meant for partnership. Again, I'm not an expert on God. I don't live in God's mind. So this is, this is my, this is how I see it. I also think when I think about a rib, um, what does a rib do? Like where, what's behind a rib? Like a lot of really important organs, like my lungs, my heart, my liver, my spleen. I don't have these. I'm not going to live very long. So I think if something came from a rib and a rib protects, maybe that means that a woman is protected. Um, and if you want to protect something, typically it's because you love it. Uh, we typically protect things we absolutely love, okay? So um, I would say that when I look at these things, um, you know, where, what bone was used, um, where it is in proximity, um, you know, side by side, um, and the function of a rib, then I would say, you know, it, it, in, it, at least to me, it seems like, you know, a partnership um, of protection. And not, that isn't listed in any of the characteristics that, you know, uh, we spoke about earlier or we went over earlier on what a misogynist is. Um, and here is my last point. 
And um, then I'm done. The last thing that I wanted to share on this topic um, is that when, when we think about God's promises, when we read promises um, in the Bible that God gives, they aren't gender biased. I, I haven't read, like, for example, really famous the Lord's Prayer, like, give us this day our daily bread. Um, it's, it's not for just men or it's not just for women that God's going to give us our daily bread. Um, it's indicated for everyone. Um, another example, my favorite verse, um, it, which is in Isaiah 49, 16, it talks about how God has us tattooed, um, on the palm of his hands, on both hands, actually. I think it's also in Zephaniah too. Um, and then our, our walls are ever in his sight. So that means that we, it doesn't say, it says, I have graven you or I have tattooed you on the palm of my hands and that I'm always looking at you. So it's, it's you that's a general universal word. It's not a he or a she. So all of, so this indicates to me that God cares about women and men and so that would be kind of a mismatch between someone who would maybe um, keep promises to men and break promises to women, right? Because that is a sign of a misogynist. Um, and just things like adoption or salvation, um, that's from women and men, right? Um, he has other promises of giving us joy, of giving us peace, of giving us strength, of always loving us um of planning to prosper us there's so many um protection there's so many different promises they're all when i read them um they're they're all for everyone that you know believes in him that follows him that chooses to have a relationship with him it's not a promise for men and not for women or um so I would say that at least when I look at this and I look over my experience um, personally and my personal relationship, and then I look at these other attributes and I look at how, you know, these promises are written for everyone, not just some people, um, but every single human, therefore, um, like I said, that believes in him, uh, when we look at examples of Jesus and how he treated women, like there's definitely more. If you're interested, you can, you know, do your own research, of course. Does not, these examples, right, at least in my interpretation, do not line up with the characteristics, at least that, you know, psychology today gave of a misogynist. And when, we look at, you know, the part of the body that a woman was taken from, from a man, you know, from the side and think about what that, that function is of protection. So like a, a protective partnership, again, to me, that doesn't indicate a misogynist. So obviously, you know, if you have any questions, you're definitely welcome to um, reach out. You're definitely welcome to disagree with me. <laughs> there is got, there's going to be no offense. Uh, I think that's the beauty about all of this is, you know, we can all take information and do make our own determination about it. But I did want to speak on it because I do think that a lot of people particularly women, have been, you know, very hurt by the church. There have been um, a lot of church leaders and a lot of teachings that have, have been misogynistic um, over the years. 
And so when we really think about that, I, it's, I, I can definitely see how people might feel that way about God. Um, but then, again, I, I do advise doing the, you know, the own research um, and seeing if things really line up with the definition. Um, and there was one more thing that I wanted to share. What? Oh, yes, and dating. Definitely, just if nothing else, I hope even just by, you know, speaking about what a misogynist is or looks like, because, you know, the article did indicate that they can be kind of hard to figure out. Like, if they're not necessarily easy to, like, a, a misogynist isn't necessarily easy to uh, spot, you know, right away. So, for those of us women who are single or dating or engaged, I think it's it's definitely an important thing so that we don't accidentally end up with a misogynist um, or overlook warning signs, um, not realizing what they are, and uh, then have uh, you know an, another healing journey to go through. Um, so I'm going to uh, in the comments after this video post, I am going to like rewrite the characteristics of what a misogynist is so that you guys can have that as a quick reference. And as always, you can, like I said earlier, reach out to me if you have any questions, but don't feel comfortable, you know, sharing publicly your questions or comments because our healing journey can be so personal. You're always welcome to send me a private message private dm and i wish you guys a wonderful week and take care peace